So, um, what's this doing here? Anyway, hi. So, um, I indeed want to encourage discussion, and um, there'll be no math in this uh, talk, yeah. or very, very little of it. I want to just talk about like the implications and concepts of zero knowledge proofs and how they interact with, uh, you know, blockchains. So, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been researching various forms of these things I'll call crypto proofs for, it's an informal term because there are actually a whole variety of them and they're very different um, since 2001. Um, my personal aha moment, so each one, everyone has their own aha moment about blockchain. So, so mine was in, in May 2013 and I want to share a little bit with you on, on what I over time learned about that aha moment but I can summarize it that like blockchains and crypto proofs work very well together. And I think now I can better articulate why, but at the time it was just this. Is there like a difference between Eureka moment and Aha moment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the personal discovery versus the scientific, the discovery, the scientific is... discovery. But I confess that in previous uh, slides I called it Eureka, but uh, I guess, okay. Eureka is more like I discovered something really important to humanity, like uh, Archimedes, uh, you know, uh, that thing. And it's, this is more like, you know, this is, I realized something personally as opposed to, uh, okay. Um, this uh, led uh, then to being the founding scientist of Zcash, along with uh, Alessandro and uh, five others uh, were the seven scientists of uh, of uh, Zcash, uh, homage to the seven samurai of Akira Kurosawa. And uh, most recently, um, I'm a co-founder and chief scientist um, in the east of Starkware. Ale covers the west. He's also co-founder and uh, chief scientist, but in the west. Um, What's the between Starkware and Zcash? Um, two different companies. Uh, one is doing, uh, one, one, okay, Zcash actually generated a coin called Zcash. Uh, no, no, we're very happy, uh, you know, and, and Starcraft does not have a coin and does other things. I'll tell you a little bit about our first product later on, but that's a little bit about myself. Um, it, the talk over you, I want to discuss computational integrity as a general value and different ways, four different ways to achieve it. One of them is via proofs. Then I want to talk about um, uh, ZKs at their best, according to my biased opinion. Others will, 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 will find other attributes and will call this family of um, really nice ZKPs, uh, ZK Starks. And again, it's a very biased view. And then uh, again, this will be very informal without any like numbers or uh, theorems or anything. And then I want to just describe this very practical use case that will be on blockchains soon and like show you how you know, various attributes of this particular ZKP family can be used to, to solve problems in blockchains. So let's start with computational integrity. Um, who's familiar with this story? Raise your hand. Oh, it's a marvel. OK, this is a, a, a child book rendition of this famous uh, Chinese fable that tells of an emperor that uh, didn't have any children, and he had to select his heir. So what he did is he summoned all children in the uh, kingdom and gave each one of them a pot and a seed. And they were all instructed to take that plant, so this was in the autumn, um, water it every day, and then come back on the first day of spring. And uh, the emperor will select as his heir the one with the prettiest flower. So, okay, who knows the rest of the story by now? Okay, it's a really good... Uh, okay, so the end of the story is that everyone shows up uh, with their pot and you have these amazing flowers and there's only one young child that stands very much ashamed and has an empty pot and then the emperor announces that the one with the empty pot is the heir why because all seeds that were given to these uh, children were barren and there was only one child that acted with integrity so it's a story about integrity Integrity is doing the right thing in a reliable way. And the value of integrity that all of us, you know, appreciate and aspire, even though according to the story, it's a bit hard for, for humans to actually achieve it. Um, this value of integrity becomes much harder 
to ascertain when um, you know, the actions you're doing or the instructions you're told to take are not done in a public domain. They're done privately, like you know, watering this flower in your home. And even more so when you have an incentive to you know, misreport the output. So that's uh, integrity. And computational integrity is a similar thing. It is, um, so we all the time hand over um, instructions to computers. These are called computer programs. And we want them to sort of operate according to those instructions and report the output in a reliable way. And as time goes on, more and more <clears throat> things of importance are actually done on computers. You know, all of the financial world, all of the healthcare, uh, forensics, everything goes through computers. So, so much of our freedom and, and values and, sorry, freedom in our property and, uh, you know, anything that is important to us, more and more of it is going on to computers. So there are often huge incentives that could be reaching trillions of dollars to, to misreport the outputs. And, and often these computations are done in private. So we really, really need to, to work in this world, to be in this world where you have computational integrity, where when a computer is announcing its output, you know that this is indeed what it did, just like this uh, in this story. So this is a value that we would like to have. And actually, we do have it. Like, you know, our banks are pretty much operating with computational integrity when they're computing uh, whatever, how much we have in our balance and so on and so, and so forth. So I'm aware of four ways to achieve uh, or you know, to enforce computational integrity. The first two are very prevalent, and the last two are sort of more new or less prevalent in terms of how many uh, systems of great importance are covered by, by these methods. So the simplest one is naive replay. It basically means that whenever uh, some other party is doing a computation that has great importance, and I might suspect that, that it's not doing it, uh, or you know, it might cheat, I replay the same computation. So I ask for all of the inputs, and I basically recompute it. And if you think about it, the reports that we get from various financial institutions or the tax uh, uh, forms that, that we submit often are of this nature, that like uh, any party receiving it can basically recompute everything and just check that they got the same result. So this is a very prevalent uh, method. Um, and it is widely adopted. It doesn't really prevent uh, privacy. It doesn't scale very well because every new uh, entrant that wants to know that someone else did something okay needs to basically recompute uh, the same computation. Um, it has this big advantage that you really don't have to trust anyone. If you, you want to know that something is correct, you just replay the computation. So in terms of trust, it's, it's uh, ideal. Um, and sorry, this is, a, this is a bug here. It is also intractable to compromise. So like if I want to cheat you, that, that, uh, you know, but you're going to naively replay any computation I did, no matter how much, uh, sorry, OK, this means something good. So uh, it is intractable to compromise, right? There's no amount of, of money at my disposal that will make me uh, cheat someone else uh, if he's doing a naive replay of whatever I did. Now, delegated accountability is also this very prevalent system that pretty much, you know, between naive replay and delegated accountability, I think you covered for like 99.99% .99 of all stuff that goes on in the world. Um, this is the process of taking various people and delegating to them the process of checking these systems. So, you know, regulators, auditors, uh, accountants, um, right? You, you, basically appoint them to go to banks, to healthcare institutions or whatnot, and sign off on checking the computer processes, but a lot of them are, compu are computerized these days, uh, signing off that everything is okay. So we, we as a society delegate, we appoint these experts and we tell them go and check that everything's okay on our behalf. So this is widely adopted. Um, it does solve privacy concerns, you know, uh, other than the, these uh, uh, delegates delegated uh, folks, uh, others don't see what's going on. It also scales very well because you just send a small group of people. Um, the downsides are that you have to trust humans. And uh, because of that, if you're given enough money or incentives, you could actually corrupt the system. Right? You can go to those uh, um, folks and you know, bribe them or coerce them to sign off on things that are not exactly um, correct. And this does happen, as we all know. 
Okay, the, newer, uh, the two newer kinds of methods to achieve this, so one is the trusted execution environment. So today we have things like SGX, previously it was TPMs. So this is like this sort of hardened uh, computer that you can't really, you know, you send uh, it some, some instructions into it, but you, know, you can't tamper with anything going inside and will sign off internally on, on the correctness of, of the output. So it's not widely adopted. It is very good in terms of privacy because you know, nothing goes out of that uh, execution environment at, in the best case. It is um, mildly scalable because the question is, I mean, these, these hardware modules are rather small and they cover small computations, but uh, um, so, so and, and you're limited somehow to that size. Um, you have to trust in hardware both in uh, the sort of physical assumptions that you can't like look at this hardware and extract these keys from it, and also in the hardware manufacturers that put these keys that they won't reveal them. And um, because of that, it's not clear that it's intractable to compromise. I would actually make a more strong statement that they are very much um, tractable to compromise because from two different angles. First of all, given enough money, you can uh, bribe or coerce someone that works at these manufacturing plants to sort of tell you what the keys that are being planted are. And another way that is completely separate, and this is what happened to the TPMs back in the day, is that uh, some physical processes were, were found that will actually extract uh, these signing keys from, from inside these models. And once you have the signing key, you can basically cheat very easily. So they are somewhat uh, tractable to compromise. And the last one, which is the focus of this talk, is, is the notion of uh, cryptographic proofs, uh, often referred to as ZKPs. So again, they're like uh, the trusted execution environment. They're not really adopted very much. Um, they do solve privacy very nicely. Um, they're also uh, scalable. I would say more scalable than uh, um, trusted execution environments, but not as scalable as delegated accountability. Um, the real big advantage in them is that you have to trust only cryptographic assumptions. And because of that, to the best of our knowledge, even given all the funds in the world and all the power in the world, um, for a lot of these systems, we have no idea how to actually break them and then like, create a proof of a false statement. Right? Irrespective, even if it's the NSA and it wants to work its uh, you know, uh, best or worst, it, uh, we don't know of ways that it will feasibly be able to break them. So. The next uh, part of this talk is going to be a focus on proofs as a means, you know, dive in as to, to this last uh, row about proofs as a means to deal with computational integrity. But if people want to ask questions or like discuss now uh, just these, you know, different methods of computational integrity, um, we can stop. So the first three are all <coughs> replay, no? What? The first three are replay. The last one is really the only different one. Um, well, the, the third one is replay and signature, right? There's some signature. You, you're, and and I, I should say that in all of them, you start with a replay. So also all of these cryptographic proofs also start with a replay and then do a lot of stuff around it. But the proof could actually be while you, make, while you compute it, you compute the proof in sequentially. So it's like, it could be different than, re, like as you compute it, you compute a proof that it's correct too. Right, you're saying maybe, yeah, maybe in a cryptographic proof you, you, you do, you start with a naive replay, but then you do all kinds of things. Uh, no, I, 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 I agree with your comment that uh, the first three are more, simply, say, certainly the first two are, I, I guess the second one is just sort of replay by a selected group of delegated folks, right? That's the big difference. That when you trust them and then, you know, they tell everyone that it's okay, but in terms of, um, a technological way, they do exactly a naive replay. And then the third one, you're right, it will actually also replay the very same computation. Or, uh, oh, you get a signature. You're right, oh, you're right. It's not, uh, you're, yeah, it's not actually a replay because in a trusted execution environment, you don't have someone else coming in and asking for it. The party that makes the claim uh, or runs the computation just does it once. I agree, so, yeah, good. Can I ask a question? Uh, so, okay, yeah. in terms of scalability, I always assume that trust execution environments will be more scalable because you run the competition with a signature and it will be much quicker than 
The question is, uh, so, so first of all, uh, yeah, I think, okay, they're much faster, but uh, when I talk about scalability, I think more about, uh, you know, how as things grow, both the length of the computation, let's say the memory patterns and things like that, how amenable is your uh, framework for that? So you always need more compute. Um, I may be wrong here, my sense is that, um, but, but I may be completely wrong, like with SGX, for instance, you will face all kinds of memory limits or program size limits. You can usually buffer them, put them outside, so there is a way around it then. So, so okay. Um, I think Joe wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess I was going to comment your second bucket is potentially pretty big, encompassing everything from somebody randomly auditing parts of a computation to uh, kind of the, I guess the, the modern take on it is like Arbitrum or Truebit, where you have like different parties can sort of, they have a financial incentive to repeat computation. And then the second bucket is the second row? Uh, second yeah, row. yeah, second row. Ah, okay, as opposed to column, okay. I'm actually not sure where like Truebit or Arbitrum would fit here, because they involve some cryptography, they have incentives, it's not necessarily a designated... You're right, you're saying fraud proofs are maybe a fifth row, an entity on... I, I need to think about that, I, I agree, because everyone is invited to sort of uh, be a delegated, uh, you know, watchtower, and there are efficient ways for showing when something wrong happened. I like that, yeah? So, uh, yeah, and it doesn't fall into any of these, uh, it's... Trust there is sort of in rationality or economics. Right, I agree. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that, that's good. Yeah? I don't think it's fair to mark trusted execution environments as question mark for scalability and zero knowledge proofs for check. It really depends on the problem you're thinking of, because there are problems where the TEEs are like very scalable, like if you just like submit your tax return with a proof that is correctly computed or whatever. You but get. that's not scale. I mean, for me, the definition of scalable is what happens when you take some parameter and you, you know, increase it. Yeah, so basically you could have like an infinite number of people submit tax returns and there would be like no extra work for verification. That I wouldn't call scaling. Like many repetitions of the same problem. When I think of scalability, I think of, uh, you know, there's a fix, let's say, um, but not like... You're saying like so, scaling so out. So TE scales greater than the number of users, or can potentially. Or, or like, uh, I would call it like batching, or like you want to do many, you want to do many, many iterations of the same small computation, or many instances of the same small computation. I agree that in that case, um, TEs are, are going to deal with that with no problem. I was thinking more about. Then you're going to want, does he give me it? Right. I agree. So maybe, yeah, you're saying there's a, how fast they are or how, you know, how much of a slowdown do you incur and then how scalable it is, meaning that how, uh, you know, as, as this one, let's say, you know, you're doing something over a database, sorting it. So as you take the size of the database and increase it, how does it uh, affect? And then, okay, I agree, yes. So I guess another disadvantage of the second row or maybe just a true solution uh, is that you cannot have 100% guarantee from, if I think from a game theoretical perspective, right? If you think about like, if everybody, I'm 100% I'm, I'm going to check you, then I know that you will not commit any crime. If you don't commit any crime, I have no incentive to check you because now I'm not going to any, get any reward. Yes. So coming out of this, it's always going to be a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium that like, if everything is going to be probabilistic, then there's nothing deterministic. But I guess some of the solutions actually can approach that deterministic. Outcome. You're saying that if one adds the, um, the um, you know, fraud proofs, yeah. then it's not quite, so what Joe was saying that it's trust in economic setups, but you're saying it's a little more, you have to do it the right way for those economic incentives to actually be there for it to... Prove economically that it cannot be 100% uh, reliable. Okay. I think like maybe just that kind of it like, helps you because some of the solution you are trying to provide may even have better advantage. Yeah. I think you can make the same claim even about uh, cryptographic proofs that everybody can assume the person won't cheat because they have to provide a proof and then why would anybody verify the proof, right? Even if it's very cheap to verify the proof, there's, there's still sort of a weird incentive problem if you... I guess maybe, I, I, maybe, I don't know where you're getting, maybe his argument is some of the crypt cryptographic 
checks are much cheaper, I hope so, then they, they, they are cheaper, summer. but like as long as the cost is non-zero, your same argument applies that everybody should assume that, uh, right, that yeah. there's no incentive to cheat, so therefore why should I verify? Mm -hmm. Right, like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let's continue. I, it's really great that we're uh, discussing, and uh, you know, even if we run out of time with the third part, that's fine. Okay, so now I want to, again, uh, this is very informal. I, I want to sort of dive a bit deeper into some of the advantages of, you know, ZKPs at their best, um, of these crypto proofs. So how to think about a proof of computational integrity. So I think a good starting point for those who are not familiar with them is to think about a grocery receipt, especially in the good old days when... Uh, it was all done by hand. So there is a statement of computational in integrity. Uh, the statement is that the total sum to be paid is correct, right? We want, uh, so the grocer wants to convince the customer that this is correct. So the grocer here acts as the prover. It's the party making the claim and trying to convince the other party. And the verifier is the one that, that actually foots the bill and wants to check it. So here what we have is really a proof. It's a string of characters that convinces us that some computation was done correctly. In this case, summing up a bunch of numbers. Um, so there are also an instance of a proof that it happens to be done by naive replay, right? If you want to verify this proof, you're really rerunning the same computation that the grocer would have done to sum things up. And they have some very good uh, uh, advantages. They are deterministic. There's like no randomness. There's no error probability, um, they are non-interactive, you get this piece of paper that you just walk around with it and you can show anyone. So those are big advantages. And they've been around for a while. Um, but the kind of proofs that, that uh, we're discussing and have interest in are have three disadvantages in, in the same areas. First of all, they must use some forms of randomness. They do incur some probability of error, so it's worse than the good old receipt. And um, they, they involve some form of interaction. So it's not like something you just walk with this piece of paper. It's some form someone should have sent messages back and forth. So they're much worse. Well, why are they good? Because they offer many, many good advantages. So maybe the most uh, famous one by now is, is zero knowledge, which you can think of as, as the ability to blind some of these entries, uh, whichever ones you choose and nevertheless have the other party, the verifier, be as convinced or you know, up to this small prob error probability that the computation was correct. Okay. Um, that's the zero knowledge property. There's a separate property that uh, sometimes you, you, know, you could use it in conjunction with zero knowledge or you could just go with it uh, by itself and that's the notion of scalability, um, which means that you have two things at the same time. You can generate the proofs uh, in, in nearly linear time with very little uh, uh, overhead um, uh, compared to just running the naive computation. And at the same time, checking them becomes exponentially smaller or logarithmic in, in the size of the computation. So now as, as the size of the computation grows larger and larger, you have this bigger discrepancy between the ability to prove something and how, how fast it is to, to check it. And another good attribute, uh, often referred to as universality or completeness in various uh, complexity classes, is that you can apply it to any computation, not just the summing up of integers, but uh, even to very complex computations, like you know, your tax returns or... Um, some of these systems, and now I'm heading more towards... Uh, you know. So zero knowledge is not only for, for, for problems, and, and NP problems that have... Uh, no. No, no, we know to construct uh, NP, sorry, uh, zero knowledge proofs for things above NP. I thought that it's only for next, but now like with these quantum versions of it, it goes to at least doubly exponentially next, but you know, there's no end in sight for now. So anyways, yeah, but it covers, you know, enough computation that we care about, um, yeah. So another attribute that some of these systems have uh, is, is transparency, which means that all the messages that come on behalf of the verifier are just random coins, public random coins. So there are no secrets from the point of view of the verifier. Um, often this is called no trusted setup or public coins, or it has other names. Um, and some of these systems, not all of them, also rely on very lean and uh, you know, sort of battle-hardened cryptography that has been around for decades, hashes and stuff like that. 
symmetric cryptography. And this makes them post-quantum secure, some of these systems. So some of you know where I'm heading toward. A, a system that has both the privacy and then a zero knowledge and this form of scalability and is transparent, uh, we refer to it as a ZK Stark. There are many other names of, of uh, you know, forms of, of zero knowledge proofs that emphasize different things. Uh, the most famous is perhaps SNARKs. It requires it to be non-interactive but allows pre-processing things. Uh, there are NISICs and succinct NISICs and CS proofs and you know, a whole bunch of them. And then a variety of implementations. So um, let's pause here just to you know, have a discussion on, on uh, the advantages or disadvantages of these kinds of proofs. And I, I, I should say, you know, the cryptographers here, uh, they're, they're, I'm sure, very, very opinionated, but I'm more interested in hearing the you know, more uh, social science uh, folks uh, opine. Any comments or questions? Why philosophically there should be short proofs for something complex? Yeah, it's... It's amazing. Well, this goes back to, uh, yes, uh, BFL. Yeah, completely amazing. The, 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 it was completely surprising back in the day. I think it was the early '90s that, that uh, at this minor price of, al pro price of allowing randomness and interaction, you can do unbelievable things like having a verifier check and sort of control the correctness of, of something that runs uh, exponentially more time. In all these systems you need, there is interaction hiding inside. Yeah, it's even the non-interactive ones are, you know, there's some, you can sort of limit the interaction to the very first phase where something is selected. Yeah, yeah, but you can't like purely non-interactive. Because I always thought about zero knowledge as the as the kids, uh, the kids puzzle. So somebody comes to you and says, uh, I know how to count the number of leaves on the tree. Yes. Interaction to prove him wrong. Right. So the non-interactive ones are still uh, have a form of interaction, but it is very limited. For instance, at the very start of time before everyone uses the system, once and for all, you know, a bunch of keys is selected. But, but you can't do without that phase, right? It's mathematically impossible. I mean, okay, you are severely restricted to non-interesting complexity classes if you do away with that. Or maybe even there's no zero knowledge, I forgot. But they, like, you know, for all practical purposes, you need uh, um, some interaction. Okay. Other comments, questions? Okay, so now I want to tell you why, um, as I view it today, why I think blockchains and crypto proofs uh, really, really go along well. Um. So the the, yeah. the proof the proof of uh, I did the computation right. Mm -hmm. If I relax the privacy, I don't care about the zero knowledge. Yeah. I care about just correct or incorrect. Things would have been much easier to do. You would have thought, but I in in practice uh, zero knowledge. It's getting the proof that's hard. And, or getting a succinct proof or getting a proof. And in all systems I'm aware of, adding zero knowledge in hindsight turns out to be almost trivial. And a lot of it is uh, like, uh, goes back to some form of this uh, Shamil secret sharing. Uh, you know, you add a little bit of uh, randomness. But you know, again, this is surprising. You would have thought that like it should be very hard. I guess a different way to think of it is you're working so hard to get this notion of a proof that by the time you got that, or a succinct proof, doesn't matter. By the time you got that, adding zero knowledge turns out to be uh, not that hard. Okay, so, um, I mean, first of all, back in the day, so this was like 2013 or 2014, but I think it still is correct. Like if, maybe it's starting to change. If you go around and you meet some person from the conventional world, let's say the banking system or, you know, healthcare, and you tell them, oh, we have this amazing cryptography. It's called uh, zero-knowledge proof. You can do a whole lot of stuff with it. You know, 
they will sort of uh, blink at you and uh, say, I mean, now they might say, oh, we need a POC to put a bullet uh, in some presentation to the board. But uh, like they will sort of uh, try to understand, wait a second, who's going to prove what to whom? The bank will prove to the customers that it's uh, keeping its funds correctly. But what do you mean? You don't like this bank, so go find some other bank. Or maybe the customer is going to prove something to the bank, but the bank will say, what do you mean? You're going to tell us everything about your financials. You trust us. That's why we're here. And then if you go to people in the blockchain space, and this was true even you know, six years ago, and you told them, we have this thing called a zero-knowledge proof, they'll stop you very quickly and say, uh, OK, here, first of all, they'll tell you, here are five applications we want now, and just show us where the code is. Like, don't, we, you don't need to explain to us why this is important. So this was something that uh, um, I, I sort of felt already many years ago. And anyone doing ZKPs and talking to blockchains felt it similarly. But I want to articulate why maybe this is the, um, the case. So in the standard world, we have this notion uh, that we discussed of delegated accountability, right? That we uh, sort of uh, uh, appoint these uh, accountants and regulators, and they go out and check that the banking system is OK. But in the blockchain space, there is this amazing, um, I don't know, philosophical or ethical um, value of inclusive accountability which basically says verify, don't trust. And anyone with a laptop and connectivity to the internet is invited to sort of download the blockchain and be part of this big uh, democracy of, of checking that everything is OK. So this is a, an amazing and powerful um, new concept that, that uh, maybe someday you know, all governments are going to need to sort of uh, stand up to. Or sorry, you know, uh, work in a similar way. We wish they would. Uh, they're not there yet, or banks and so on. Um, but this uh, beautiful idea of inclusive accountability has two downsides. Um, it sacrifices privacy, obviously. Everyone sees everything, so they learn everything. But it also sacrifices scalability, because now if you want to, again, think of scaling up the system 10x or 100x. So whatever the speed right now of your bandwidth is and the strength of your uh, laptop, you need to scale it up 10x or 100x. So this is not uh, something that is uh, sustainable or scalable. And I want to say that scalable ZKPs solve both problems. So if you have the zero knowledge aspect, you can solve the privacy in a very uh, obvious way. You can see why it could help. You're now shielding things and proving that these shielded things are correct. And uh, that's pretty much what Zcash was, I think, the first to do, in, in, at least in the in most uh, extreme way. And you can also use them to scale up the system by, by just not letting everyone perform all computation, but just someone can uh, perform it on their behalf. So um, I want to explain a little bit more about scalability, because privacy is more discussed. Uh, so I want to talk about scalability. So here we have a graph. I think this is about as much math as we'll see. So uh, we would like to push our throughput to this side, right? We want to, let's say, process more payments or things like that. So, but but um, as we're doing it, we need to increase the computation time of everyone who's checking these proof, uh, these these things, um, uh, pretty much linearly, right? And um, in the world, we have like huge uh, clouds uh, with tons of computers. So there's a lot of compute power out there, right? So we could scale up just by using more compute power. But um, all blockchains um, put the, a limit on the amount of computation. Why? Because of this uh, value of inclusive accountability. You want everyone to be able to track everything that is going on in the network all the time without you know, needing to buy uh, large computation time from, uh, from Amazon. So. You know, in Bitcoin, it's uh, whatever, how many b megabytes uh, a block is limited. In Ethereum, the gas limit, uh, you know, de does a similar thing. It limits the amount of computation to something that is much smaller than the amount of computation out there in the world. So now we have this distinction between what you can do off-chain with vast computation and on-chain. But we still want everyone to be able to hold the whole system accountable. So now you see why a scalable ZKP can really help. Because you can have a single prover um, creating a proof in nearly linear time. And then everyone else, just in exponentially smaller or in logarithmic time, verifying that proof. 
And then you get this big scalability factor. The larger the amount of computation, the bigger the scalability factor. And it turns out that in many cases, the amount of computation grows so slow that you can push inside a single block limit a whole lot of uh, uh, computation. So I want to say that if you use scalable ZKP, you can solve the problem of scalability while preserving the notion of inclusive accountability and not requiring everyone to go and, and increase their computational power by a factor of 10 every time you want to go to. Of what? Is this a linear scale? What? Linear scale, what's your y axis? Um, yeah, this is linear by linear scale. Yes. So uh, well, with, uh, with ZK proofs, you can prove that the execution was correct, but you cannot prove data availability, right? So yes. It's not that you, can prove every, you can scale everything this way. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the data availability is a big issue. Uh, maybe we'll get to that later. I don't want to go into it now because it's a, it's a separate. Uh, it, it, like all technologies, ZKPs don't solve all problems. And and. Uh, so that's a good question. The proof proves. Yes. Proves what? I'll, I'll give an example. Let's say that it processed uh, ten thousand payments. And now the state of the system that is just captured by a Merkle root of the database moves from A to B. That's your x-axis and y equals zero? It's funny. Yeah, I need to maybe, you know, uh, yeah, it could be off. But I think this is the, the function of logarithm, and this is the function of uh, n log n on a linear by linear scale. Should be. <clears throat> Say that one again. I thought, we were, I thought we were linear earlier. Could you repeat your last statement just once more time? What? Which statement? About that this, I'm saying this looks like the logarithm okay. function, and this looks like uh, n log n if this is n. Okay, got it. But it may be that it starts off not at zero or you know other things. But So here's a different way to think about it. So uh, a blockchain scalability problem, everyone has these computers. And uh, what if we could have like one party using a much bigger computer, but then everyone else working much less? So you can do this. Uh, uh, the on-chain computation that is now carried out by everyone that needs to check every transaction could be replaced by something that just verifies a proof. And then you have this prover that is not limited to the, the computational restrictions that are on-chain, and it can run on a big Amazon cloud. And then uh, it compresses the amount of computation that the other nodes need to do. And in order to make this better, you want to batch many, many, you want to move the scale or go all the way to the right as much as you can, and then you get bigger savings. So any questions on this part? Yeah. Yes. So you have been in the last talk of WAVE. Yes. So. But I'll just verify whether there was a, 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 what you get revocation or not. What is what is this it? involves no uh, assumptions and no signatures on anything. What, what? Th that nowhere do I require any signatures or any person having any secret key and anything. It's a big uh, difference. But she, this was a talk about accessing accessing data. Is there? Is there a, a certificate to do something? When you say certificate, you are in this world. The whole world of certificates is about having some root of trust, which you assume will start signing off on others, signing off. So there's this whole notion of signing. There are special parties that are. Signing is a computation. I agree, but I'm saying here, this whole framework that I'm describing, you can have Darth Vader entrusted with proving. You cannot have Darth Vader entrusted with starting off the. Well, he's a bad guy. I don't know who's your favorite bad guy. The Joker. You cannot have a... You have a magic thing that, that does search for me. I, I want to know a proof uh, whether there is a, uh, you have access or don't have access. And you say, oh, there is a proof. I, I can do it for you for nothing. For, for, you know, I'm just saying that, that Wave lives in a world that is very important and interesting and cannot be replaced by this stuff because of man in the middle. Because man in the middle is, in the end, I'll tell you why. Because you want to know that when you access Bank of America, you're accessing the real Bank of America. But from a computational point of view, there is no real Bank of America. 
Okay. She talked about a blockchain. Yes. There is a blockchain. Then there is. I don't want to go over all the blockchain to know whether there was a revocation or not. So okay. So this is the same problem as here. Yes. I want to know was there is a revocation or and you you say I solved it with zero knowledge proof and that's okay. It. Why not? Why didn't she tell me she say? Oh, now we. Why should maybe take it offline because I have to remember. I think in her uh, uh, um, system it is in the end signature based, but maybe I got it wrong and. What signature based? In the end, there are like signatures, but may, am I right? Is it signature based or it's a okay? So it's a it's a different. Uh, you you have more you have different assumptions. You're assuming that there are some parties that are special, and they start the process. Here, you do not assume anything about. My analogy, my thinking about what she said is like, we all learn early early on the the union and the union fine problem. What yeah. is I have a blockchain which says union fine, union fine, and at the end I want to know, oh, now this uh, node belongs, uh, what's the name of the root of, uh, yeah. of this node? Okay. Let, we you are telling me that... Maybe take this one offline. Yeah, let's take it offline. I okay. think there is an application, like he's uh, talking about uh, compression of work and proofs, and maybe there's a way to apply this We see a magic, we need to, to understand what's the, what's the scope of the magic. Okay, we'll, we'll take it offline, because I think there are different assumptions uh, that are applied here. Okay, other comments on? Uh... Okay, so let me now instantiate this uh, like theory in, in like, uh, I want to tell you about a product. This is the product of uh, uh, Starkware that will you know, hopefully be deployed in two months. Um, but it uses these notions of scalability on blockchains. So, uh, you know, most of what goes on on blockchains these days is speculation. People are buying and selling coins. And if you want to participate in this uh, lovely activity, you're going to probably have to lock your funds inside a locked exchange, which means you're basically transferring custody of your funds, and they are now locked up in this exchange. The big ones are like Binance and Coinbase and whatnot. And now you sort of, uh, they are taking care of your funds and your secret keys, and you give them instructions. Okay, there's also the notion of free exchange. Sometimes it's called mis by mistake, like decentralized exchange. But it means that while you're trading, you never hand over custody of your funds. They're always with you. You can take them wherever you want or give the keys to anyone you want. Um, so the reason that most of the trading these days on cryptocurrencies is actually done in locked exchanges is because they have very large scale and very low cost because most of the stuff that you're doing never appears on the blockchain. It just is uh, you know, internally on the books of the, um, of the exchange. <coughs> Sorry? I agree. <laughs> Latency as well, right. And when you do it in a free exchange, it, uh, it, uh, it is... Uh, well, latency depends for what? For trading, it's very fast, but if you want to retrieve your funds, actually the latency... Right, but, but uh, I'm telling you that if you want to extract, if you want to take your funds outside of, uh, an exchange, of a locked exchange, you're going to wait much more time. The latency would be, will be much worse. So as long as you're inside this, uh, this uh, nice garden, you're, 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 you're very fast. But once you want to take it out, okay. To a limit, to a limit. So okay. Slower to take your money out of a locked exchange. Several reasons. One is the, the, it's their assets. You know the keys are there. Especially think about a situation of like a run on the exchange. You need to extract things from uh, cold wallets, bring them on board. You need to have all kinds of managers and security officials sign off on it, and uh, so on. Just because of the way they, they uh, just because people are not like in a free exchange, you're saying everybody's in charge of their own keys. So you, you don't have it's to yours. At blockchain speed, you can take it wherever you want. You have a situation where you need a cold wallet and a hot wallet. Or yeah. Well, it's yours. It's it's like each it's trader inherited. decides uh, w w how they keep their funds. But like it's this. not inherent in the lock exchange. You you could f conceive of other security measures. Um, I think they. I mean, they would all involve huge hot wallets that I think. Some think of, for example, signing with MPC protocols. Or would still be hot. It would still be hot. Yeah, and then NPCs, you know, if you get if you get n minus one of them, and uh, but in free exchanges, I mean, your your keys are still hot in the sense that but it's just it's your no, your keys are you're free to do with them whatever you want. Yeah, okay. So um, 
our, then this is, you know, what our company is going to do is going to power exchanges with uh, these EKPs called Starks. And it turns out to be extremely scalable, inexpensive, and also free or non-custodial. You don't have. So the, the problem is that because of this honeypot risk that like everyone is, uh, you know, um, putting their funds, uh, sorry, the exchanges need you to lock up your funds with them. Uh, and there's this huge honeypot, you know, there are meltdowns and hacks from time to time. Um, traders are dividing their assets across different exchanges. And then there's this liquidity fragmentation where you can't really sort of move your funds very quickly from one uh, exchange to the other. And it takes actually a very long time to withdraw things. So those are the current problems. And um, first of all, what Stark Exchange does is eliminates this huge honeypot. There is no more because every trader has his own funds. And it also becomes uh, you know, frictionless to move from one trading platform to the other. Um, and the way it works is that currently, if Alice and Bob want to trade in a free way on uh, the, the network, they're going to have to send, this is on-chain and this is off-chain. So they're going to have to send some transaction to be settled on-chain, and this is very costly. And that's why there's very limited scale there. Um, our concept is that sort of uh, this trade is done uh, on an exchange, but then a batch of these trades that are going to be settled are sent to a prover. And then a prover generates a proof, and the proof is exponentially smaller. And what is sent to the main chain is only this proof and the new state of the system. So here's how the system architecture looks. Um, on, the, on the Ethereum network, we have two smart contracts. One is the big contract that just manages everything, and you know, um, that's the Stark Exchange. And the other is a more restricted one that just verifies proofs. And then uh, Alice and Bob and a whole bunch of traders work on the exchange and interact. And um, they do their trades. They sign orders. And when these orders are matched, um, the, which is taken, uh, this is done by the exchange, uh, a batch of these uh, pairs of signed orders that are matched is, are sent to settlement. And, uh, and now what you have is this database. And this touches on the data availability, availability problem, like where is this data kept? Um, and what happens is that the StarkX engine generates a proof that updates, you know, it batches many trades, and it generates a single proof that updates the state of the system and says, here's a new Merkle root for the state of the system, and this is what goes on chain. And uh, then one, once this is accepted by the Stark verifier, the StarkX uh, uh, mother contract uh, uh, updates the state of the system on chain. So I just want to show you the effect of scalability on gas price. So it's good to bear in mind that a single naive settlement, if you want to do free trading today, costs around 200,000 gas. So this is a pretty large amount. It means uh, each block in Ethereum has at most eight, is, is limited by 8 million gas. So you can do at most 40 trades in a single block. And that's why it's very slow and costly. So this is the gas limit of, uh, of a single block. <laughs> and what we see here is that as the batch sizes of the number of trades goes up, you see this uh, sort of amortized, the amortized cost in gas of each single one. This is the effect of, you know, exponential, of the exponential function when you amortize it. Um, so each time you increase the batch size, the amortized or the gas cost that a single trade has to pay goes down uh, pretty significantly. So at 8,000 trades, each uh, trade costs uh, like 800 gas. And we can now generate already proofs that cover a settlement of 32,000 trades, um, which is, uh, gives you a, a rate of 2,000 trades per second. And the proof fits inside a single Ethereum block, which give you, gives you an amortized gas cost of 200. So it's 1,000 times more efficient in terms of the gas cost. And um, I'll just summarize, and then we'll do the question. So um, I, th I tr gas, like for. Uh this now will be less than 6 million gas. I don't know about the 32K might be close to 6 million or maybe 8 million. I don't think that usually we'll be running these things. And by the way, the gas cost is going to go down once we have EAP 2028, which should be like in uh, two weeks. So, but right now, um, so I think this would be like slightly less than 8 million gas and we'll go down to let's say 4 million gas, I'm guessing. 
and these ones are, so in our demo it was a thousand, this cost six million gas, but it's gone down a little bit, so, yes. Oh, wait, wait, let me, let me just, uh, let me just uh, summarize briefly. So I tried to convince you that I think proofs are the best way to establish computational integrity, uh, the minimal trust assumptions, and you get privacy and scalability. Um, I try to share with you my aha moment that like proofs are really, really good um, for achieving or supporting inclusive accountability at scale. And I told you a little bit that uh, this thing that will be deployed in, in two months, uh, powering uh, Diversify, which is an exchange uh, that is uh, uh, basically will offer Bitfinex's liquidity. This, this is a you know, product that will use this uh, kind of proof system to scale trading on Ethereum very soon. So that's, yeah, so, yeah. Well, so, so this is cool, but I'm, I'm curious. Is your order book public? The order book is at the discretion of the exchange, right? So we are, we are a settlement engine for an exchange. Okay. Now, the exchange uh, can decide what it wants to do with its order book. I think, yeah? So are you proving that if the order book is private, are you, proving, are you just proving the orders cross, or are you actually proving that? Fair, fair, uh, fair matching? Yeah. Currently, we are not proving fair matching, but we can. ZKPs can do that. We're not doing that right now. But that's, uh, you know, that's... What exactly are you proving that these transactions happened and the uh, state updated correctly? Roughly, um, each order has to be signed with uh, you know, a secret key that corresponds to a, so a vault, which let's say an account, holds a, a public key and a token type and an amount. So suppose I have uh, you know, banana coin, you have apple coin, and I really want to buy uh, apple coin and uh, trading for my banana coin. So, I will sign an order saying I want to you know, trade this pair, um, and I send it to the exchange. Maybe at the same time, you're signing a, a counter order that you want to trade. So now what the prover proves is that the orders were signed correctly. They are indeed uh, you know, leafs in a Merkle tree right now. The, the, sums, are no the sums traded are no larger than the, um, the balances that you had there. The balances after the trade were accounted correctly, and so on and so forth. So Prover needs to keep the database of all these transactions to be able to prove? Yes. Prover and the exchange and uh, yes. But you don't trust the Prover, just the verifier is trusted. Okay. Yes, you don't have to trust the Prover, yes. Uh, and, and the Prover, actually the Prover, the Prover cannot, uh, the Prover cannot change uh, the database uh, um, in a way that does not follow from a sequence of orders that was, uh, actually signed, and, and the prover doesn't have any of these keys. Neither does the exchange. So the worst we can do if we're hacked is uh, halt the system, which is unpleasant, and there are mechanisms for you know, allowing uh, people to retrieve their funds, even in this case that I didn't describe. But we cannot, even if we're the most malicious, and we cannot uh, steal your funds or, or execute an order that you didn't sign. Not us and not the exchange. Uh, awesome, yes. Compared to Plasma? Plasma doesn't have uh, any ZKPs in it, and I think it's, it uses fraud proofs, which is this, uh, right, if I'm not mistaken? There are different proposals of Plasma, and I think some, some places that you mentioned in the start. Okay. okay. I, I, I'm not following uh, enough. Uh, Stefan, maybe uh, one way to view it is that each state transition here is directly proved to be correct. Uh -huh. as opposed to execute it and then contest it if somebody were to be find, found otherwise. Yeah. Uh -huh. so it's well, it's sometimes, you know, the Plasma thing is like blog posts, and I think they had in some places descriptions of things like, you know, that every transition is proven uh, with Starks. Of course, often the details are missing. I think it would be probably... Yeah. Uh, That's a future plan that they... I mean. Yeah. Is, uh, is a high claim. Yeah. <laughs> do, you have, do you have like execution of smart contracts on this platform or just payments? Just payments. Yes. So the ZK statement is going to verify two, two signatures and then do like the UTXO update semantics? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> that, like uh, 8,000 times? Like, so how do you, I mean. More than 8,000. Um, like, uh, yeah, we can fit, um, you know, up, uh, we can fit um, 32,000. Um, like, uh, so you, you basically, what, what does the uh, chain see? 
it seizes, I mean, it has uh, in storage a Merkle root, and it sees a new Merkle root and a proof. A proof of what? That these trades were settled correctly. There exists n sequences of pairs of signatures. And the statements in the signatures are of the form blah and blah, and this update right here updated the what I, what I want to prove is I, I want to, to avoid computation. And computation for me is going over the chain, all over all the chain. So what I, I want is to you saved here. To take, to, take a, to take a public key, let's say, and know, and suppose I have access or something. Like to take a public key and know what is the current balance of, this, of the account of this public key. Is this something that uh, that does it, the, 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 the no? That's not covered by it. But also information theoretically. I mean, if this has a million accounts, you need uh, so you need there are a million different queries somewhere. This uh, information, if you want it to be on the chain, you know, it's gonna something has to give there in terms of scalability. So part of the way scalability is achieved here is no, this information does not go on the chain. Um, so it doesn't solve this problem. You're gonna have to talk to the exchange or you know find. Uh, where the data is, it's not on the chain. You could prove it succinctly from the roots that you, you could yes. show that. Yes, that yes, 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 yes. So the exchange uh, will give you the information, <laughs> oh, or Starkware will give you the information upon request. So, so the gas price actually is only the start verifier. That's why it can be so, so, so low, because it's just verifying hashes, right? It's just in the IOP. And, uh, and some logic, but the hashes are the big so cost. Really signature verification in yes, the oh yes. Oh, sorry, it happens off-chain, but like what the verify, sorry, what the prover proves is uh, a bunch of signatures and then a whole lot of uh, Merkle paths. That's the statement, but I mean the yes. actual gas cost is just going to be doing some hashes and checks, right? Like, uh... Right, the gas cost uh, of the verifier is comprised of checking authentication. Pa okay, a Stark proof looks like a bunch of hashes, which in Ethereum we're using uh, Ketchuk because it's very cheap. So it's a bunch of hashes and then some linear algebra. Uh, which is related to the statement. So the, that's what the verifier pays. Um, it's, it's, it, it tolls up very quickly, but uh, yes. So verifier doesn't need to check the digital signatures at all, basically? No. No, digi no the verifier checks no digital signatures. Uh, yeah. The smart contract main thing, there's a, a ramping process that I didn't describe, but it's very important. Like when you send coins to the exchanger, retrieve them, this cannot be part of the, you know, now the main chain needs to do something because like the smart contract, the Stark X contract needs to send something to your account. So there's sometimes a little bit more. And then there are signatures on the main chain. But that's only for taking your funds out or bringing them in. Your trading uh, does not expose uh, any signatures. Uh. And that also would change the roots in some ways, right? Yes, yeah, so everything, right. Yeah, so there's a, there's a ramping area. Uh, on chain, which is exactly where you know funds are deposited until they're updated in the Merkle root, and then they disappear from uh, the chain because now, now they're accounted for inside the database and the vi and the other direction. Yeah. Uh, maybe your last statement just clarify that. I didn't quite catch the the ramping thing. There's you know there's before you. I mean, I thought that you know, the, your say your ether would be in your control, in your account, and you would just sign it going out of there. But tell me about this ramping area again. I, I okay, so from the point of view of the Ethereum uh, uh, network, I mean, what do you see? This thing keeps a Merkle root of a whole bunch of stuff, but the chain doesn't know anything about what's under this Merkle root. Who has what? Okay. And you want this, uh, and, and the main chain, I mean, it knows of this thing, but it doesn't really you know, relate to it. This is like, you know, talks only to this. So now, you know, let's say Ether is going to come here so that you can open an account. And then at some point, you know, Abhi is, uh, you know, going to take Ether out. So there should be, first of all, all the funds are here, are deposited here while being traded there. And then when you want to ramp off, you basically want to say, well, you know, from that pool of Ether, that is deposited, I really, uh, so Abby is going to say this, I, I really, you know, I deserve whatever, five ether, and here's my signature, and you know, it's in a Merkle leaf, and I have those funds, so please uh, send them to my address. And this also has to be taken care of. So this is the ramping aspect of, of this thing. So, so just to be clear, for a little while, we have uh, Stark ether on our account, as a, and the accounts 
your little Stark X account has the Ether, and we have Stark X, Stark Ether. It's like all ERC20 tokens are all wrapped coins, or you know, the smart contract will hold. Uh, I'm, I'm, and then, but it's still like. You know, you, it's an automatic process, and you can't really uh, take that ether uh, if you don't own the, um, you know, the, the keys that, that show that you have it. So I have kind of a related question. Uh, let's say we have a couple of exchanges that want to have the fancy start goodness, and uh, would they be interfacing the same contracts there? I, I, I Hopefully, yeah, and then you can actually do like a uh, net settlement across them and move funds very quickly from one to the other without touching the main chain. We'd like to go there. there what about what about different tokens? I didn't quite. What? Uh, like uh, how many tokens? Is there a limitation on the? Uh, well, if I have my favorite token that I want to. Banana coin, everything you know, <laughs> shit coins, the whole thing. Let's say you didn't want the zero knowledge property. We're not using zero knowledge here at all. I, I'll say this. It's very easy, relatively, to make the proofs actually formally be zero knowledge, but you gain almost nothing because with, without like changing everything, like the account-based model. Like you'll need to move to some shielded UTXO commitment tree style uh, Zcash model, um, which would significantly change the system. Um, so, so it like it is meaningless to put uh, to make this thing uh, zero knowledge as it is right now because like all the information is leaking from everywhere around. But it's not like the proofs are leaking so much information as it is. I mean, they're not formally zero knowledge, but you see a bunch of Merkle paths and then some field elements. So it's not like. But they're not formally zero knowledge. They actually leak knowledge. It's just not very uh, meaningful knowledge. Yes. Could somebody compromise the Stark Prover? I'm, I'm just missing something, so I don't understand. The Stark Prover I have to trust? Or? No, 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 you do not have to trust. So if someone compromises the Stark Prover, they can shut it down. No, no, I, I mess with its algorithmic operation and manage to... There is no way to... No, no. Yeah, no, I mean, assuming there's no bug in the verifier, in the verifier, you can run this on... So this goes back to the you know, words of, of uh, you know, the early 80s of uh, um, BFLS and these other papers. You can have this running on faulty hardware run by malicious entities that, that are even, in, in some settings, even computationally unbounded. They made Alice and Bob do some transactions. I prove a different transaction. Well, Alice, Alice, for instance, said, I am willing in the next 24 hours to sell my banana coin for Apple coin at a certain rate. Right? So you can mess with the exchange because maybe there was a, so she's giving some limit order, you know, if, as long as it's above $2, I, I'm willing to sell it. Now, maybe a fair exchange would have sold it to her at $10, but there's a malicious exchange here that actually generates uh, some, some order at exactly $2 and sort of cheats her. But uh, that's, uh, yeah, we're not covering this aspect of matching at all. Yeah. So what, so let's say Alice and Bob in the exchange, they, uh, I trade a dollar, and, uh, and you put it into the StarkX. What prevents you from taking the same pair of signatures and running the transaction again? There is a mechanism for that. There is a unique transaction idea that, that, uh, that, that prevents this. But you're right, it's yeah, a good. That, uh, somehow uh, things are used up, and, and you keep another data structure of like. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there are a lot of details, but it's a very good point. For instance, if you have many dollars and he has many, um, whatever, let's say, banana coins, and you just gave one order, the exchange or us, we could replay it in again and again to deplete uh, your accounts. So there is a mechanism in the system that prevents this. So when you're signing on an order, there's like a, you're signing also on some unique order ID and it has to be different each time and things like that. So it is something that is prevented. Basically, I mean, Ethereum has the same thing for the same problem, right? Huh. It's an account model. Uh, every yeah, every you transaction in Ethereum, you sign who you're paying and a counter of the total number of payments that you've made so that you know, they can't be, because there's no UTXOs in the account. <coughs> so every payment is just like Alice signing that she wants to transfer X to Bob. So. All right, so you could deplete her account. 
But uh, just, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a common problem a lot of things face. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I don't know, how are we in terms of time? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think, I, think, yeah, I think we're out of time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Sleep by the bell. <laughs> no, no, I'd like to say, okay, we'll take it off. Okay.